It's good to be with you once again, and happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers uh, in the church. We are so thankful for you. Uh, we are thankful that our world still has a lot of godly moms, and we're so grateful to you. I don't know where we would be without our mothers, but I just want to say happy Mother's Day once again. Hope everyone is well and staying safe and healthy, and uh, Lord willing, uh, we're going to be back together real soon. It's been said that mothers are the most influential people uh, the world has. Uh, fathers are the head of the home, but it's been said mothers are the heart of the home. You know, mothers are the anchor that oftentimes holds the home together. Uh, when everything else seems to be going off the rails, moms stay in the trenches, and oftentimes they're the ones who hold uh, the home together. Uh, they're nurturing and caring and loving, and so... Uh, you know, when I heard that I was going to have a granddaughter, I was going to be a grandpa, uh, when Alyssa called and told us, uh, I was happy for them. I was happy that they were going to have a child of their own. I was happy that I was going to be a grandpa, even though it made me feel a lot older. But honestly, I thought that, you know, as I was thinking about having a grandchild, I thought, I thought to myself, I wonder what kind of world that little Charlotte will grow up in when she gets to be older and she is out on her own, what will her life be like if the Lord should not return and the world should march on? What is the world going to be like? I can't imagine. It actually scares me a little bit, but I know this. God is in control and he has everything well in hand and we don't have to fret and wring our hands because he's still on the throne. He's, uh, he's there. He's making intercession for us with the Father and uh, we don't have to fret because he knows what's around the corner. You know, I, I was thinking about this. Uh, they're giving Charlotte, the little baby Charlotte, they're giving her the middle name. It's a French name, Soleil, uh, which means sun or sunshine. And because she has brought sunshine back to their lives after the first pregnancy was a miscarriage, they decided to call her Soleil in the middle name uh, to sort of make a reference to the fact that, hey, the sunshine is returned. And, and certainly we know that, you know, when the sun, when the sun shines bright every day, Everything seems to be better. I don't know about you, but I miss the sunshine during the winter months. But you know, in our text this morning, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter number 1, and we're going to see the story of a great godly mother named Hannah. Uh, did you know that if your name is Ann, Annie, or Anna, you are actually named, uh, your name is a derivative of the word of the name Hannah. And so if you're named after Hannah, Hannah, uh, you uh, you share that name and what it means, and that is this. It's grace or graciousness. And so praise the Lord. Hannah was a woman that was living, however, she was living with a stigma. In her day, if a woman could not birth a child, she was considered to have a stigma, or you might even say a curse of some type. But So Hannah prayed and asked God for a man-child, and despite of this, uh, God was going to use Hannah to teach us some very valuable lessons about being a godly mother. Uh, she's, she, she, uh, God used uh, Hannah to uh, teach us some principles that if we'll apply them to our lives, and especially ladies, if you'll apply them to your life, uh, you can be a godly mom as well. So today, let's learn from these five principles on the life of Hannah. By the way, these great principles I said a minute ago are for everyone. Anyone who uh, invokes these principles into their life will also share in the blessings that they bring. 
But ladies, I want you to listen to me for a moment. If you'll adopt these five principles into your life, you will not only be a woman of God, but you'll have the tools necessary uh, should the Lord allow you to, uh, to be a great mom, a godly mom, and so on. Uh, you know, consider these five principles that, that we look at today. Uh, they will not only ensure that you'll be a godly mom, but they'll also ensure that you will raise not just good kids, but you'll raise godly kids. And so this morning, let's look at principle number one. First of all, we see here in uh, 1 Samuel chapter number one, we're going to look at verses 10 and 11. Hannah, the first principle, Hannah was a woman who had her priorities in order. Oh, to God that women today would have their priorities in a godly manner or in a godly fashion. But let's look at what the Bible says in verse number 10. The Bible says, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all of the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his head. Notice in the first part of that verse, it says, Hannah wept bitterly. She wanted a man child from the Lord so badly that it was a tremendous, uh, such a tremendous desire for her that it caused her to weep bitterly when she was praying. Hey, how, when's the last time that you wept bitterly for a prayer request and you laid that petition at the feet of the throne and ask God to meet this need or whatever it was in your life, whether it was for a child or some other great need that you have. You know, we need to be weeping more in our prayer time and asking God and begging God to do the things that we need or the things that we uh, desire for our life. Uh, Hannah promised the Lord that if he would answer the prayer, she would give him and dedicate him back to the Lord for his service. This was Hannah's great priority. Hannah was a woman of priorities. She said, I want a man child so that I can give him back to God so he can serve God all the days of his life. And the truth of the matter is this, what we see from our scripture this morning is that when God did answer the prayer, Hannah kept her promise. Hey, you know, let me ask you a question. How many times this morning uh, when you've been, not this morning, but how many times when you've been praying and you've been asking God for something that you needed or desired uh, really badly with a passion that you said, God, if you'll only give me this, if you'll only answer this prayer, I'll do this. And then after God answers the prayer, you just forget totally about the promises you made. I'm pretty sure this morning that many of us have found ourselves in that place, but this was not Hannah. Hannah said, if you give me the man child that I desire, I will give him back. And Hannah kept her promise. Psalm 127 verse 3 says this, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb of his is his reward. The fruit of the womb is his reward. You know, children are given to parents as a reward. They are God's heritage. They're a blessing and not a burden. Any mother who will abort her child is basically saying to God, this child is not a blessing to me, uh, God. You gave me a child. He's not a blessing. It's a burden. And I can't be burdened. I have too many things I want to do and accomplish. And, 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 and oh to God that these women would, would, would understand that when they abort a child, they're sinning in the eyes of God. And it's murder uh, like the Bible calls it. Psalm 128, verses 3 and 4, the wife shall be, says this, the wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, thy children like olive plants round about the table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Children from God are a blessing, not a burden. Uh, we should never look at children as a burden. They're a blessing to parents, not something to be complained about, not a burden. They're a blessing and they're, they're God's reward. Notice in those verses that I just read in Psalm 128, olive plants are referenced here as something to be raised and they provide further fruit. And if we will raise godly kids and teach them the things of God and raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which by the way, the Bible commands parents to do or to be, uh, there's, there's drastically something wrong with a woman when she views a pregnancy as a burden that needs to be terminated. The womb should be the safest place for the unborn child. 
But today it's become the place of death. It's like a death room for the unborn child in many cases. Uh, it's a death place for, at the hands of ungodly women and ungodly doctors who who uh, break their Hippocratic oath and, and take a life without any reason other than the woman has decided, I just don't want this child anymore. I, I can't handle this child if they're not going to be a perfect in every way. The second principle that we see from the life of Hannah, but not only was she a woman of, who had her priorities in place, Hannah was a woman of prayer. You know, prospective parents should be praying for children long before they're expected. Hannah was praying for her man-child for a long time before Samuel was conceived. Children that are a prayer, answer to prayer, by the way, are far more likely to grow up and serve the Lord and be raised in a godly manner. Why? Because parents are praying and they realize that as they pray and they ask God for a child and God delivers that child, it's an answer to prayer. And godly parents are going to want to do the things that they're supposed to do to raise godly kids. The book of Ruth, chapter number four, in verses 13 through 17 says this. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of life and a nourisher of thine old age. Uh, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, uh, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the woman, her neighbors, gave it the name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. You know, Obed was David's grandfather. And uh, I just wondered this morning, what would have happened uh, if Ruth had decided after becoming pregnant, that she decided she didn't want to have a child and she had aborted the child. Uh, what would that have meant for the lineage of the Lord Jesus? Now we understand God could have done something else and probably would have because he keeps his word. But just think about that. What if Jesus had never been born? What if young Mary had said, no way am I doing this. I'm not going to have a pregnancy and be a reproach to the community like I'm, uh, people are going to think that I am if I've done something wrong. And she had said, no, no, God, I'm not going to do it. Uh, what would have happened if the Lord Jesus had never been born? I'll tell you one thing. We would be here this morning without any hope at all of eternal life. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 43 also records a woman who had been praying. Her name is Elizabeth. And she gave birth to a son named John. He would become John the Baptist. She was given the child well up in age. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And Mary uh, uh, understood that as well. You know, Hannah was a woman of prayer and she began praying for her man child long before he was even conceived. I wonder in this world, uh, if this world and its evil abortion clinics have ever wondered or thought and asked themselves this question or just kind of put this thought in their mind. I wonder this morning as we, if I'm in an abortion doctor and I'm in a clinic and I'm getting ready to abort a child, I wonder if I've thought to myself, hey, you know, this child that I abort might just possibly be the one that God has said with the knowledge that he will learn and he will achieve to as he gets older. I wonder if they've one, thought to themselves, hey, I wonder if this is the person who has the complete cure and eradication for cancer. Has the world missed the cure for cancer because a child that carried the knowledge in his mind that was created by God and in the mother's womb, their life was snuffed out? What if a person God brought forward in a mother's womb uh, who would finally eradicate Lou Gehrig's disease has been aborted? Not only was Hannah a woman with the right priorities, Hannah was a woman of prayer and she prayed diligently that God would give her a man child. Not only did she pray and not only did she have her priorities right, but number three, Hannah was a woman of purpose. Hannah was a woman of purpose. 
Look at 1 Samuel chapter 1 again. Look with me at verse number 11. The Bible says, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Hannah was a woman of purpose, so she knew Samuel's purpose before he was even born. You say, well, uh, that seems a little bit uh, uh, unfair for, for Hannah to determine Samuel's purpose before he's even born, before he grows up. What gives her the right to do that? I'll tell you what gives her the right to do that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's because God has given Samuel to Hannah as her child. She is his mother, and it's up to mothers and fathers to decide and nurture their children uh, to, first of all, be who God wants them to be. See, today, parents, when they have kids, oftentimes God is the furthest thing from their mind. Uh, they could care less if their children grow up in the nurture and admonition. Or too many kids today are growing up without any influence of God in their life. No God in their home. No God in their schools. No God anywhere they go today. And most parents are perfectly fine with that. And I'm telling you, that's why our world is in the mess that it's in. is because too many kids are being raised in an ungodly atmosphere, in an ungodly manner. But Proverbs chapter 22, 6 says this. Train up a child, now speaking to parents, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Samuel is a testimony of this verse. Parents have bought into the lies of the world with regard to raising kids. And, and they've bought into the world's philosophy about the things that they think kids, kids should have and need and all those things. And the problem with many kids today is they're given way too much freedom to come and go as they please, do as they please, not take correction, not respect authority. Hannah wasn't going to have it that way. Hannah was going to a purpose in her heart that she was going to give to Samuel a purpose in his life before he was even born. And she prayed and asked God about that thing. And God laid it on her heart. You mark it down. It will come back to haunt you, parents, if you raise your child uh, without the nurture and admonition of the Lord in his life. And if you give your child too much freedom, uh, children cannot handle the freedom that parents are giving them today. And I don't care how smart your little Johnny or little Sally is. If you give them too much freedom, they're going to grow up as an ungodly adult. No wonder young adults are leaving the faith. No wonder young adults are leaving the church. Too many Christian parents are giving their kids way too much freedom to come and go as they please, to be with who they please, to do what they please. And I'm telling you, that is not God's way. God wants us to create an atmosphere of love and nurture and kindness and care, but he wants it done within a structure of discipline. Discipline doesn't mean a bad thing. It's not a bad word. Discipline is simply this. If you look it up in the dictionary, discipline is training. God wants us to be training our kids to do the right thing. Hannah said, I promise, Lord, if you'll give me a man child, I'll give him back. Not only did she say she'll give him back, she said he'll have a vow. What does that mean? Numbers chapter six and verse five says this. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall set the locks of the hair of his head uh, let the locks of his hair uh, uh, grow. Samuel was going to be born and given a Nazarite vow. He was going to be encouraged to make the Nazarite vow and to serve God with his life. Now we also know that the Nazarite vow was a determination made by the individual when they were able to understand it and everything. Uh, but they could decide to do it as long as they wanted to or they could decide to do it for the rest of their life. It was up to them. If Samuel was an answer to prayer, and we know he was, Hannah said, I'm going to keep my promise I made to God. Why? Because Hannah was a woman of purpose. Hannah's word was her bond. It was, uh, it was her, it was her uh, God-given child that she was going to respect God for giving to her, and she was going to keep it and be a, a purposeful mom and do what she said she would do. Hannah was a woman of purpose. And she said, that God should have first claims on Samuel's life. You know, that's true of every child born. 
If, if children are a heritage to the Lord and they're his reward to parents, hey, doesn't it make sense that parents say to the to the child, hey, look, at, uh, we want you to grow up and we're going to nurture you in the admonition of the Lord. But listen to this. You ought to give your give the Lord first claims on your life. You ought to say, hey, Lord, if you want me to do this or do that, or if you want me to serve you here, or serve you there, I'm ready to go. I'm willing to go. I'm obedient to go. And if God doesn't want them in the full-time ministry or full-time work of the Lord, then they can go ahead and be something else if the Lord leads them to that. We ought to teach our kids to give first claim of their life to the Lord. Basically what Hannah was doing is she was receiving that child and she was dedicating him back to God for his service. That's a great principle for young parents today. When you have a child, you ought to dedicate those children back to the Lord and say, Lord, they're, the children are yours. You gave them to us. We're just simply stewards of these, these kids. And we're going to present them back to you. And if you choose to use them in full-time service, then here they are, Lord. And we're going to do everything as parents to help them along in that process. Hannah's God-given desire was, was to, to present Samuel back to the Lord. You know, several years ago, a young lady we met, a missionary to uh, Africa told us her testimony and the story about as the Lord was dealing with her heart about being a missionary. She was a single woman and uh, she was living at home with her mom and dad. She had recently graduated from school and she felt like the Lord was dealing with her heart about becoming a missionary to the orphanage, working with another veteran missionary there in Africa. And he had invited her and another friend of hers to come, young ladies that were single and uh, they were godly ladies that he invited them to come and help him in the missionary school and the orphanage there in Africa to care for the young children that were orphaned with no parents. And the, the Lord got a hold of her heart and as she began to pray on this thing and began to understand that it was God's will for her life to go and, and be a teacher there in that orphanage, she brought this news to her mom and dad. It was her God-given desire, and she brought it to her mom and dad and said, I believe God is dealing with me about being a missionary to the orphanage with brother uh, so-and-so in Africa, and he's asked us to come and invited us to come, and, and I'd like to know your thoughts on it. And immediately her mom and dad were a little bit upset about it, and they said, well, no, we don't think that's something God would have you to do. Uh, it's too dangerous. It's not safe. It's too far away. You'd be too far away from home. And her heart was broken. However, she told her mother and her father out of respect for them and understanding the will of God for her life, she said, if that's your desire, I will respect it because she understood God's word about a young woman. Young ladies are under their father's authority until they're married. Now, there's nowhere in the Bible that says young women are supposed to launch out on their own without their father's approval or authority and just go about life in a happy way and think, well, you know, I'm a woman, I'm 18, I can do it. God does not honor any of that in the word of God. Women are supposed to stay with their parents until the father turns over, uh, turns them over to the husband at the wedding altar. He's transferring his authority. When he takes that daughter's hand and places the hand in the hand of her husband, he is surrendering his authority over her and giving it to her husband. So this young woman was respectful of her father. And she said, dad, if that's what you want from me and you don't want me to go, she said, I'm going to respect you. She said, I need you to know that my heart is broken because I believe this is God's will. And he said, well, we'll continue to pray about it. And praise the Lord, after a short period of time, he came to her and he said, honey, if this is what God's will for your life is, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna let you go all those ways away from us and be in a place where I'll worry about you. But I know that if you're in the will of God, you're the safest place you can be. She's now on the mission field serving there in that orphan and she's been there for a number of years and she's doing a great work for God because she was willing to be obedient. I wonder what would have happened to her if she had told her father, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I'm going whether you want me to or not. I don't believe God would have blessed her in the same manner. You know, Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 through 21 is a prayer that I believe all parents should pray for their children. Certainly, moms should be praying this prayer. What does it say? It says this for, this is for uh, Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 through 21. It says this, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And then listen to this next part, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Oh, to God that parents would be praying like that for their children. It goes on, it says, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. What a prayer. Parents can be praying with that kind of purpose like Hannah was for Samuel. Parents should have definite goals for themselves. Uh, they should teach their children to have goals, but they should be reminded of the principle that says this in the Bible, if the Lord wills. Not only was Hannah a woman of priority, a woman of prayer, a woman of purpose, but number four, principle number four, Hannah was a woman of persistence. What does that mean? It means she didn't give up at the drop of a hat. First Samuel chapter one and verses 12 through 20 says this. Verse number 12, 1 Samuel 1, verse 12. And it came to pass as she continued praying, notice that, continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart only, her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought that she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away the wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah and Elkanah and Hannah, uh, knew Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel saying because I have asked uh, him of the Lord and the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord a yearly sacrifice and his vow what do we learn from that passage of scripture we learn this that Hannah was a woman of persistence when she was questioned about why she was praying and why she was sorrowful and, and so uh, so uh, desirous of having a man child, the man of God there, Eli, thought that she had been drinking. And she says, no, no, I'm not drinking. I'm just simply, I've given my mind and my heart to this prayer and I'm begging God to give me a man child. And, 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 and God, what we see in the story is God was going to answer her faithfulness. Why? Because she was persistent in prayer. How many times have we prayed for something one time and then we get all down in the mouth because God doesn't answer our prayer and we give up and we don't pray anymore? I'm telling you this morning, ladies, listen to me. If you want to pray something for your children and pray that your family is going to be well taken care of and pray that your husband is going to be saved if he's not saved or your children are going to grow up in a godly manner and, and serve the Lord one day, you got to be persistent and keep praying. Don't give up after one time. Oftentimes, as Christians, we're guilty of just simply praying a little prayer and throwing it at the throne of grace and saying, there you go, Lord, do what you will with it. No, we got to be persistent. Hannah was a lady of priority. She was a lady of, uh, of uh, prayer. She was a lady of purpose. And she, she was persistent. She was a lady of persistence. God remembered her prayers, I believe, because she was persistent in her prayer. The Lord remembered her prayers before... She, Samuel was even born, and the Lord remembered her prayers after he was born. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, says something about persistence. It says this, but they that will wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We got to wait for the Lord to answer. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You know, all too often in our world today, we're raising up a generation of quitters. When things don't go the way that we think that they should or 
Well, the young folks oftentimes today don't think that they go the way they should. They just quit and go elsewhere. Why so many marriages are breaking up today? Because the, the young people are going into these marriages with the wrong expectations, not being trained and taught anything about married life according to the word of God. And when things get tough, they just quit and go other ways. One of the most important things to remember about praying persistently, persistently is waiting on the Lord. That doesn't mean you pray and then just wait. It means you pray, you wait, you pray, you wait until the Lord answers. Keep on praying and wait for him to answer in his timing. A preacher friend of mine who wanted children so badly, him and his wife did everything that they could do to try to, to, to have a child of their own. And they went to the doctors. They went to all of the things that they needed to do to try to make sure that everything was okay and and it just didn't seem to work out. So then they decided that they might try to adopt a child and they did all the work that they needed to do, paid all the things that they needed to pay. And the Lord just didn't seem fit to give them a child. I remember praying about that with them and praying for them that God would answer their prayer. And, and I believe they were persistent and I believe they continue to pray. And then God. They are now raising a beautiful little girl. And God gave them a little girl, but he gave it to them in his time. And I believe they honored their prayers because they continued to pray persistently. Their sorrow, like Hannah's, was turned into gladness. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 2 is a testimony to Hannah's persistence in praying. After Samuel was born and after she was dedicated back to the Lord, Hannah's persistence did not end after Samuel was born. But in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, we see a testimony and we see the actual uh, 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 example of Hannah's persistence in praying for her son Samuel. You look at that when you have an opportunity. Not only was Hannah a person, a lady of priorities, a lady of prayer, a lady of purpose, uh, was a persistent lady, but lastly, at number five, she was a persuasive mom. Hannah was a lady that had the ability to persuade those for the good and for the glory of God. You know, some parents have absolutely no control over their children. Now, I'm not talking just about lost parents. I'm talking about Christian parents as well. I've met a lot of Christian, Christian families over the years of ministry, and I've watched and I've seen that a lot of Christian families and parents have absolutely no control over their kids. Their kids pretty much do whatever they want to do. And when they try to do discipline them, they're, it's just a mockery. Children literally run the home in many, many cases. If you're, a, if you're a Christian parent and your children have the priority in your home, then your home is out of order. God never said for the home to give the priority of everything to the kids. You don't find that anywhere in Scripture. If your kids are running your home, ladies, if your husband is second to the children and they get, they get all of your attention and then whatever's left over goes to your husband, then you are not right with God. God's order in the home is the husband is the head. The, the wife is, is, is the husband's help me. And the children are underneath that somewhere along the line. His needs are secondary or not secondary to your children. His needs should come first. If you're a godly mom and a godly wife, you need to realize that God has placed you in the, pla in the place of being a helpmeet to your husband and he should be your first priority, not the kids. But I'm telling you, that's not the way the world runs today. Many moms have made the kids their whole life. Parents today, to include Christian parents in many cases, have no persuasive power over their own children. If they tried to instruct their children to go a certain way, the children would look at them and say, ah, I'm not doing that. And then nothing would happen. It would be okay. What is the reason for this? Why does this happen? Because the children were not reached at an early age. The, ch the children were not taught to obey authority at an early age. Uh, you can't raise children and teach them authority and teach them the respect for authority when they get to be a teenager. It just won't work. We don't read anywhere in scripture where Samuel reached a certain age and said, you know what? 
This thing that my mother de determined for my life, this purpose that she gave me before I was born, you know what, this is just crazy. I don't wanna do this. We don't find anywhere in scripture that Samuel ever said that. And I believe it's a testimony to the influence that his mother had over him when he was a young child. I believe it was because Hannah prayed for Samuel and she begged God for a man child and she made a promise and a vow to God that if you'll give me a man child, I'll give him back to you for service to you for his life. And that's exactly what Samuel did. Samuel never came to a place in his life as an adult and said, my mom must have been off her rocker to think I'm gonna hang around this place all my life and serve God and take all the flack for doing that. No, sir, I'm not doing it. Samuel, we don't find any testimony about Samuel like that at all. Understand, the opposite is also true. Some people are in ministry today who have no business in being in ministry because God has not called them to ministry. I believe there's Christian parents that are well-intentioned that have said to their children, you need to do this, you need to do that, and you need to be this and be that. And they've not prayed about it. They've got God. They've got no peace from God. They've got no mandate from God. The children have no calling of God, but yet they've been forced into ministry because mama wanted them to be a ministry person. We say this about that. Their daddy called and mama said. Why don't parents today have more control over and persuasive power over their children when they're still at home? Because they've not been trained to respect authority. They've been empowered to be themselves. The world would tell you today that if you discipline a child and you teach them respect for authority, that you're being unfair to them, that they need to develop their own self-esteem. Well, again, that's nowhere in the scriptures. The Bible teaches us that as parents, we should make sure that the child's will is broken to the sense that they need to be tuned into the things of God first and foremost. And uh, if they've got the rebellious spirit in them, that needs to be driven out of them with a rod of correction. Hey, I know and this is unpopular stuff, but I'm just telling you what the word of God says. Does that mean all boys are meant to serve the Lord? Absolutely not. Does that mean young ladies should be preacher's wives? Absolutely not. But they ought to be prayed for in the respect. Parents ought to offer them back to the Lord and allow him to determine if he wants them in a full-time ministry. A parent should encourage their kids to understand the principle of first claims. And that is this, God has first claims on your life. And if he doesn't want you to serve in a ministry, if he doesn't want you to be a full-time preacher or missionary or whatever else God would want you to do, then you go ahead and do something else. But today that's not the way it works. Many Christian parents that sit in churches all over America pray for their children to be first and foremost a doctor or a lawyer or some other high official, never considering the work of God for their children's life. And I'm telling you, God is calling more people to the ministry today than who are surrendering. Parents make a decision to dedicate their children to the Lord, it's one of the best things that they can do. That way they're saying clearly to the Lord, hey, we understand what's happened here. We understand that these children that we have are your reward to us as parents, your reward to us as, as godly parents. And we understand that they're your children, they're not our children. We're just simply stewards of those children and we're gonna raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord like your word says for us to do. And if you want these children in full-time service, we're going to do everything in our power to raise them up in such a manner and keep them in the church house and teach them the things of God so that they can serve you one day on a full-time basis. Parents that dedicate their children to the Lord's service, they will covenant with God to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord first and foremost. You know, Abraham Lincoln gave testimony many times that had he not had the mother praying for him, praying for his success, praying for him as a, as a young man to be a godly young man. He said he never would have had the success in politics and in life he would have, but he, he accredited his success, not to the talents that he had, but because he had a praying mother who was persistent, who understood that she needed to persuade him to be a godly man. George W. Bush often gave testimony of his mother praying for him.
crediting her with a lot of the successes that he had. Why was Hannah a great mother? Why did God use this woman to raise up the prophet Samuel? Why did Samuel give us so many great principles in the word of God under the inspiration of God? Because, well, I'll tell you, he was obedient. But most of all, he had a mother that was praying for him. He had a mother that was a lady of priority. Her priorities were set on the things of God. Not only was she a prioritizing lady, but she was a lady of prayer. She prayed earnestly for young Samuel long before he was born. And she continued to pray for him during his ministry and after he was, he was grown up. Not only was she a prayer warrior, but she was a woman of purpose. Hey, this world needs women who are women of purpose, most of all today. They're not going to be taken by every little thing that comes down the road, but they're going to be purposed in their heart to serve the Lord and lead their kids and their children and their family in the things of God. Not only was Hannah a woman of purpose, but she was a persistent lady. She did not give up. Hannah was a lady who didn't give up. And then finally, Hannah had the persuasive power of the Lord on her life. You know, God can put his hand on you. Ladies, listen, God can have his hand on you and he can use you to influence your children and your family. For the things of God when nothing else will. You know, interestingly today, many churches are full of ladies with their children. Fathers are nowhere to be found. That's a sad commentary. And I believe there's a lot of men that are going to pay a significant price for that. Letting the women take the leadership and raising the kids in a godly manner. Hey, if dad's not doing it, moms, you go ahead and do it. But I'm telling you this, that's not God's plan. God's plan is for the fathers to lead their homes in relationship with the Lord and worship teaching them the things of God and the women are to have their part in that process as well, a very important part. I said to you at the beginning of this message that some of the most influential people in our world today are mothers, godly mothers praying for their kids to be successful. I hope these five principles will be a blessing to you. I hope they'll help you to grow stronger in your faith and grow stronger for the Lord. And I'm just so thankful that we have so many godly moms in our church. Continue to pray and continue to lead your families in a manner that is godly. Ladies, do your part. God has given you a specific but very important role to play in your homes. And I pray this morning that you'll continue to take that responsibility seriously and you'll do the things that you need to do to be the godly mom. And you'll understand these five things that we've talked about today. Thank you again for coming today. We're going to close in a word of prayer. And we'll look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. We ask your blessing on these things. Have your way in our hearts, Lord. Help us to be people of principle, people of, uh, of purpose and uh, persistence and prayer and all the things that we talked about today, Lord. We ask your blessing now on these moms that are gathered watching the message today, that you'll put your touch on them and you'll help them to be what they should be as they trust you for all that comes their way. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all the good that you do for us each and every day. And Father, give us strength and courage to continue to keep keeping on. And Father, we'll trust you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us this morning and we'll see you again on Wednesday night at seven o'clock. Thank you.